First and foremost, yeah, I would say I would do the, val the lateral approach if it's, say, more than 30 degrees of valgus, yeah. but it does have its problems with closing the wound at the end of the procedure. Remember with a valgus knee that the um, defect is nearly always on the femoral condyle and nearly always posterior, so be careful when you're putting your guides on for your external rotation. Routinely, when you're doing a varus knee, you tend to dial in three degrees of external rotation. What I like to do is dial in another couple of degrees, to five or six degrees of external rotation with a valgus knee. Uh, referencing the AP axis, this is Whiteside's line, and those of you who don't know, it's, it was de described by Leo Whiteside, who's a very eminent orthopedic surgeon in America, runs the current concepts meetings, one of which is, I, I think is coming to India next year and it's his meeting, he described the line. Now what he, d he discovered was that if you do a line down the middle of the trochlear groove, in about 93% of the patients, that is at 90 degrees the transepicondylar axis. So it's a very useful guide to your rotation. Much more accurate than the posterior condylar axis. So I always mark white sides line if I can, first of all, and I use that as my guide. We've done, we've, I'm going to whip through this because I think we've done this so often this morning you're going to get bored hearing about it. Tight medial lax lateral. Uh, the problem is because your medial lax the capsule or MCL is tight. You do a subperiosteal, a staged subperiosteal release of the MCL. Um, so for a varus knee, these are the way I would do I would do the deep MCL first. And the, well, I'll take the osteophytes off first, in fact. First in the wrong order. Then I would look at the deep MCL then maybe the superficial MCL. Rarely the posterior capsule. If you are tempted to divide the posterior capsule, be very, very careful. The vessels are not far behind. And particularly if they had previous surgery, I would be extra careful. Uh, recutting the distal femur, maybe I think something you have to do. The po here's the posterior capsule while I'm being, well, using some tensioners and being very, very careful. That was a video, but I can't run it, never mind. Valgus knee, tight lateral and lax medial. So we've talked about releasing the lateral side, la uh, taking off the iliotibial band. I don't pie crust it, I just cut it. Um, uh, you taking popliteus as the next stage. And sometimes baby pie crusting the lateral um, capsule. So if it's tight in um, extension and flexion, you have to release both the lateral collateral and popliteus. If it's just tight in extension, you'll get away with just releasing the iliotibial band and some of the posterior capsule. If it's tight in flexion, you need to go for the popliteus and the lateral collateral. And that was Leo Whiteside again in some of his papers. Here we see the pie crusting technique. You need to put the side of your pie crusting under tension, and then you use one of those little pointed blades, is it 11 blade, I think, and very carefully just make little stabs, no more than a millimeter or two deep in that side. And if you've got it under tension, you will suddenly, or you'll gradually see it expanding and the tension decrease. Uh, but don't do it too, too much. You, you're limited how many times you can do that. And be aware of the vessels the other side of the capsule and the, and the nerves. If you have a residual flexion contracture, things you can do, it m may mean that you haven't cut enough off the distal femur. If you've got tightness extension, you may have to elevate the posterior capsule, so you'd flex the knee, put some tensioners in, then maybe get a, an osteotome and very carefully just strip off the capsule proximally. You can recut the distal femur, which is not difficult to do. Um, so if you've got more than 10 degrees, less than 10 degrees of a contracture, a 2 millimeter recut will be enough. And for more than 10 degrees, you'll need 4 millimeters. Now, if you've used a cutting block which has used smooth pins, what you can, and you've kept the pins in, if you've got a contractor, it's not a bad thing to do, you can keep those pins in and slide the cutting block backwards, if you have that uh, in, your, uh, in, in the kit, kit that you use. So here's an, an example of elevating the posterior capsule, so it's under tension and you slide your osteotome very gently, making sure you've cut the back of the oste any osteophytes off first and strip the capsule off carefully. If you've got a tight flexion extension space, it usually means you haven't cut enough off the tibia, and that's a very easy thing to do. Uh, most of the uh, kit that you get will come with a recutting block, and so you, all you have to do is apply the block to the top of the tibia and cut off another two millimeters. Don't cut too much off. It's very easy to go too far, and suddenly you find the PCL's gone and everything's lax. So just cut it off in two millimeter increments. And here we see this, a, a type of jig that the pins on, and cuts an extra two millimeters off. It's very simple to do. 
If you've got malalignment and you need to recut, you can actually get one of these blocks which will take um, a two degree recut off that side. And so it can correct a, a minor valgus or varus uh, malalignment. And here you can see that one is two degrees off the other. And that works for both sides. If you've got a tight flexion space only, it might probably means you've had inadequate posterior bone resection, uh, which will give you a tight flexion gap. Uh, all you need to do then is to oversize the femoral component, go to one size bigger, uh, uh, one size smaller. I mean, it means you've got an oversized femoral component. Uh, you need to put your cutting block back on. You can use the angel wing if you're anterior referencing to put it on in the correct position and cut another two or three millimeters off the posterior condyles. And that's the way I do it. I put the cutting block back on. I slide the angel wing on till it's flat on the, the front of the femur, pin it back in place at the correct rotation, and take a few more millimeters off the posterior condyles. Be careful when you're putting your trials and your definitive implants in that your synovium and soft tissues don't get caught underneath. This can give you problems with particularly patella tracking. Um, sweep the synovium away and make sure that the implants are seated properly. Uh, you need to, it sounds stupid, but you need to make sure you've retained, removed all res residual bone fragments, particularly from the posterior aspect behind the tibia. Often you can get loose bodies, bits of bone that you've cut off which have slipped behind. So make sure you remove those before you cement the components. Cement fragments too can cause problems, because if they get between the polythene and the, f the femoral component in time, that'll give you a lot of disastrous wear, and you'll be revising that much sooner than you hope. <coughs> So in conclusion, if you have any problems, try and work out what the problem is and try and correct it. Make sure you've got good soft tissue balance before you implant. Uh, repeat the bone cuts at, if you need to, like we mentioned. And you want to end up with good radiographs like this. Not like this, where it's undersized and notched. And definitely not like this, where it's put, been put on inflection and undersized. Uh, this is uh, just a, a show you that instrument that we use, so we can infiltrate the posterior cap. So we use 100 mils. We put 50 mils in posteriorly, and then we save the other 100 mils for the soft tissues anteriorly. It actually makes a huge difference to the patient. They can get mobilizing very quickly. They get a straight leg raise as soon as they wake up. I've actually had one patient for a uni who walked back to the ward from recovery. Uh, and that's what you should be aiming for. Thank you. Questions, please. Questions for Mr. Hollingdale. Don't let him go so easy. I think it's hunger time coming in closer by, isn't it? Yeah, I'm just going to say, believe me, all the little complications we've talked about, I've had them all. We all have. Uh, so you know, don't be ashamed about thinking you're going to get complications. If you do enough surgery, you will. But the thing is, you must know how to deal with them. All right, so we move on. Two more talks before lunch and just to s sort of sensitize you to good times ahead. Next talk is none other than Professor Rajesh Malhotra from All India Institute. He's going to talk about the management of perioperative complications. Thank you, Dr. Maria. It's a pleasure to be here. It's nice to see you all again. and. Uh, one of the good things of working in this country is that if you have friends at the right places, then the opportunities are really never lacking, you know. All that you have to know is to know the chairman and you will get to say whatever you want to say. You would have realized that Rajiv took about 10 minutes or 15 minutes to show you the procedure. It takes much longer to show you <laughs> the complications because they are actually, they start most of the times or they are realized after you have done the surgery. It's either in the immediate uh, post-op period or on the table, you will realize you will realize that something wrong has happened, and then that's what I think Dr. Maria wanted me to discuss with you about. And uh, before I go on with the talk, and while they're just setting up uh, the projection, I would just like to remind you that there is a philosophy that you should not do a surgery of which complications you don't know how to manage. You must be you have <coughs> it's more important to know how to manage the complications than just to see just to know. Um, the uh, the fact that uh, you can do a surgery well because complications will occur in spite of a well done surgery. 
they are not dependent many of them are not dependent on the technique of doing surgery and i'll be able to show you illustriously every compilation in the book i have seen and seen some which have not been in the book also so if you do enough numbers you will see enough complications uh, i'm sorry i told this person beforehand that i'll be needing his help and he has just disappeared Why is switch it off and then switch it on this is not this is not switch off what sorry the uh, the project laptop, laptop or projector laptop. Laptop. Don't do anything. Take it off. <laughs> <laughs> These are complications even before you start the surgery. So this is how it is, you know. I mean, uh, I I told him actually. I thought I had planned well. I went to him and I requested him that I need your help. Sorry. I told him to check. So. Uh, and like in the surgery and in complications, the experience matters. So if it comes now. We we'll certainly agree oh, with yeah, yeah, experience yeah. matters. Okay, so I think that looks quite all right. Just to Put uh, put the things in perspective. We know that with aging, we need more and more of uh, uh, the uh, osteoarthritics. And what they want is many of them are very impatient. I'm sure Dr. Maria sees more of these than I do, who want to get all right right away before they can move out of the office. And uh, it is a very effective treatment. But like I said, the uh, the advances in technology and everything is now we are able to offer these surgeries to more and more people. but then here is the crux of my talk that not all advancements are safe and you could land with the problem now what is happening is that most of our patients in this group are old and the old people are more susceptible to these complications and when you want to uh, successfully complete the surgery you need to carefully plan you need to closely preoperatively monitor and you want to institute the appropriate preventive measures so that you can keep the complications at bay now perioperative complications mainly can be grouped as thromboembolism myocardial infarction some of the periprosthetic fractures um, the infection dislocation dnvd the distal neurovascular deficit and stiffness to mention a few so you can imagine that actually we can go on or it for about 2 hours and i also realize that we don't have a talk on infection instability in perioperative fractures in this so i think i'll have to take a lot of burden in next 15 minutes or so what is the risk factor for perioperative complication if a patient is elderly he is male has that di is diabetic has renal disease inflammatory arthritis hypertension particularly history of coronary artery disease and steroids and about once in 6 months we get an elderly patient who is not given any nephrotoxic drug but post operatively develops an impairment of the renal function regardless of any nephrotoxic drug or any documented hypertension so keep that in mind you are dealing with an elderly kidney and that's going to give you problems around that time now is the surgeon a risk factor for the complications of course yes because those who have high volume surgeries are known to have less perioperative complications as compared to those who do less surgeries and those are the patients uh, surgeons who are more likely to have these complications now is bilateral versus unilateral more likely to uh, cause perioperative complications the answer is yes although there are no studies which show that there is more mortality in simultaneous bilateral but there is a definite increase in some of the side if uh, some of the complications which may occur so it's up to you you may be well advised to choose your patient carefully when you want to do uh, a bilateral simultaneous because you may have a higher risk of having the perioperative complications um the death of the tk so that's a very important thing you are dealing with a surgery which is elective and to have a death at hand for a disease which would not have killed the patient otherwise even he could have lived on and he would not have died because of osteoarthritis knee the incidence is about 0.53% in different incident in different report so you must remember that and the biggest risk factor for a death of a patient around uh, the total knee is the comorbid medical condition that's what you have to remember now um, the thromboembolic events are a major uh, complication you can see that the myocardial infection can occur in 0.4% pulmonary embolism in 0.7% and deep vein thrombosis in 1.5% and the thromboembolic events are the ones which can really create problem we know that all the deep vein thrombosis are not life threatening the symptomatic ones are 1 to 2% and symptomatic pe are up to 0.5% and who is at risk for dvt is a patient who has had a prior dvt or pulmonary embolism advanced age 
congestive heart failure, myocardial infarction, stroke, obesity and hypercoagulable state. So you should be very careful about these patients. Now I did a bilateral TKR on a lady which was mother of a hospital employee and on the second day she, I saw some blisters on the leg then I uh, looked for DVT, it didn't look DVT but we saw, got a Doppler done. Doppler showed a huge clot going all through the lower limb veins up to the left common iliac vein and this is what it came out to be. It is called May Turner syndrome which occurs in the middle aged ladies who are particularly if they are on history of oral contraceptives they uh, if they are if they don't have to undergo knee replacement it could be any surgery it could be dehydration it could be uh, any problem but what it would give right to this is an anatomical aberration where the uh, right com uh, common iliac artery overlies and compresses the left common iliac vein against the lumbar spine with the result that they can have huge dvt after the surgery and that can create uh, really big problems uh, in, in these patients so you have to know that sometimes if it is unexplained, the surgery didn't last very long and still you have a you know, middle-aged lady who is uh, uh, who's come with a major big uh, clot, you should suspect that. Uh, and then we, it is prophylaxis against thromboembolism is universally recommended. Whether the pharmacological uh, pharma, uh, prophylaxis is recommended or not may be controversial. But the prophylaxis itself is not controversial. You have to give prophylaxis. You can use mechanical measure and it is absolutely imperative that uh, you use mechanical or some form of prophylaxis and it's your choice if you uh, prescribe to any of these you could actually uh, do that. Although the AAOS says that you should actually do it only for uh, high risk patients and uh, uh, what is not recommended these days is usually using just the plain simple aspirin but then this is Pandora's box. The once you start uh, opening it, the important thing is that you must remember that it is important to thromboprophylax them and when you do pharmacological one, there are risks of bleeding, hematoma, wound drainage and infection which should be kept in mind. You could start uh, preoperatively for a careful neurological examination if you are worried about the nerve problem. Uh, the uh, uh, even remote nerve palsy which have occurred in the past have been known to recur after surgery and sometimes the subtle neuropathic conditions can be exacerbated by the surgery. One of the things which worries the surgeons is the fever after the surgery and when how to decide which fever is uh, sinister and which is not and this is a very nice paper which shows that most of the patients will have a peak of temperature on the first two days or maximum three days. It is unusual if your patient is having peak on the fifth day you are probably dealing with an infection and the, and the uh, fever which is reaction to the surgery was usually not go up to 39 degrees centigrade. So if you have a uh, prolonged fever, if you have a uh, patient uh, fever which uh, peaks late and, uh, and uh, uh, peaks late then you have, uh, uh, then you have to, uh, then you have to uh, uh, be worried about infection. So a, a peak, a fever peak which is late, which is more and which is prolonged, so which is up to 39 degree. Now the other issue with these uh, patients is, uh, the, is the, uh, uh, is the, uh, the uh, uh, compartment syndrome and you could actually prevent the compartment syndrome. The problem with the compartment syndrome is that many times the patient is under epidural anesthesia. So what is happening is that the patient is not having any pain and the patient has paralysis and even if you try the passive stretching, it doesn't come as positive. And that actually uh, the epidural anesthesia as well as the peripheral nerve injury may mask the symptoms of compartment syndrome. So uh, I think this, the slides have just uh, gone uh, a bit haywire. So let me just talk about the post-operative delirium. Many of these old patients uh, have this uh, post-operative delirium which could be because of uh, the reaction to the surgery but when the patient has delirium I would strongly advise you to look for the hyponatremia because that is a very common cause in these conditions and sometimes we get patients who have chronic hyponatremia for a very long time and we need to consult the nephrologist and give them some vasopressin analogs to control uh, control their uh, uh, hyponatremia but if it is not hyponatremia the age itself could cause delirium, the cognitive impairment, history of previous del delirium and the history of alcohol uh, dependence. And uh, the consequences could be the if there is another hip on the same patient, it could dislocate, or you could have prolonged hospitalization, or uh, you could call uh, cause falls and injuries. Now about the cardiovascular complications, we have just closely alluded to it. You should be very very careful in a patient who has had the uh, previous cardiac history. There are uh, some uh, patient groups who are more more at risk for cardiac uh, events, like old age patients, 
history of arrhythmia, history of coronary artery disease and MI, congestive cardiac failure, valvular heart disease, revision surgery and bilateral surgery under single anesthetic. The other condition which will also merit careful uh, uh, consideration before doing a bilateral or looking carefully for perioperative uh, um, uh, cardiopulmonary uh, complications is the obstructive sleep apnea. So if you get an obese patient with a short neck, with the, which you uh, suspect the obstructive, uh, the, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, you should be very, very careful about these patients. So the current recommendation is that if a patient is over 50, you may be well advised to get a pre-op ECG and uh, based on the symptoms, you could do more uh, investigations. I operated on the father of medical superintendent in my hospital. He was 85, never had any cardiac problem. After surgery, he started walking a lot and third day started developing angina. These are the patients who are not walking, so they will not have restlessness on exertion. So their disease will become overt only after the surgery and that will have impact on their exercise tolerance and walking capability. So keep that in mind. Um, there is a um, risk of perioperative stroke, particularly in the elderly patients and that can be a very, very uh, a devastating condition, can lead to death. Vascular injury is another very, very formidable com uh, complication could occur in 0.1 to 2 percent and uh, if the patient has a peripheral vascular disease then it should be kept in mind. If you are on x-ray, see calcification of the vessels. Please do not use tunicate. Try to or minimize the use of tunicate because these are the patients who are at risk for uh, a vascular injury. You could do a Doppler. You could monitor the pulses. The uh, tunicates should be avoided if you know there is a documented peripheral vascular disease. And uh, it will be good if you can have a plastic surgeon on the, uh, on the, um, uh, in the house on the standby. Now, the other thing is that uh, when you flex the knee, during preparation, the uh, the uh, the vessels are somewhat higher, uh, uh, at nearer the level of the tibial cut, but they are further away. When you uh, extend the knee, they move closer. So you must keep in mind that whenever you're doing tibial cuts and all those things, most of the times, uh, be aware that you are uh, uh, having vessels right behind you. Keep the knee flexed and then the vessel is usually about 1 to 1.5 centimeter below the articular surface and also in 6% patients the division of the uh, artery, anterior tibial artery may be high and you may end up in injuring the vessel. Uh, there has been this paper where they said uh, and this is actually uh, a paper which we published about the hemarthrosis patients who were getting recurrent hemarthrosis uh, in the post-operative period we found them to suffer from a deficiency of the platelet factor 3 defect which was the cause and giving the single donor platelet so these patients uh, uh, solved the problem. Now, uh, like I said, some of the complications which we have seen have been described, some have not been described. The, when, you, uh, when you are cutting the lateral meniscus, you divide the uh, inferior lateral branch of the genicular artery and that is the artery of lateral meniscus and then people have described the, uh, the uh, traumatic aneurysm of inferior lateral geniculate artery following TKR and this is one of my own patients, a stiff knee and uh, must have struggled on the table, did this constrained knee and de developed a big hematoma post-operatively and the angiography revealed an aneurysm of the superior lateral genicular artery. So you have to be aware of these conditions and, uh, um, uh, and uh, then this is the paper I was talking about. It's strongly recommended that when you go to sign the extremity, you were told about the timeout. When you go to sign the extremity, take a look at the peripheral vascular status of the patient and also when the patient is in the recovery, make it a point that whenever you come out of OT, patient has been shifted, take a look at the foot and you'll be surprised that at least once in your lifetime you will recognize a nerve injury or a vascular injury which at that time you could have taken care of immediately and you could have uh, saved the problem. So this is about the compartment syndrome I mentioned. It's very difficult to diagnose because uh, all patients after surgery have swelling. The anesthesia is working. There is some uh, effect of anesthesia. And the risk factors are if there is soft tissue compromise, vascular compromise, intravascular injury or venous insufficiency. Now I have told you it's maybe the symptoms may be completely masked and then the patient may have a common peroneal nerve artery, artery injury which may again mask this, uh, this thing. Uh, the nerve injury occurs in 0.3 to 4 percent patients in TKR and these are the kind of patients where you should be worried that this patient may have particularly, particularly the uh, severe flexion deformities and the valgus deformities and uh, uh, make sure that when you operate on these patients keep them in little bit of flexion post-operatively. There are two things for which my residents have standing instructions. If they go to the ward and find that there is a foot drop, immediately flex the knee and the other condition we have to, they have to immediately flex the knee if they see that the drainage is, is too much because you would have seen on the table the moment we flex the knee it's, the bleeding stops. 
So if you go to the ward and see that the patient is bleeding too much, there's too much in the drain, before you inform the consultant, put some ice packs, maybe block the drain and flex the knee. That's what you would be advised to do immediately. But then these are the kinds of patients who would be at very high risk for, for nerve palsy. And remember, the anesthetists are very fond of giving epidural anesthesia and the epidural anesthesia is a risk factor for compartment syndrome. It is a risk factor for peripheral nerve injury. You have to be very, very conscious of these facts, apart from the fact that if you have a rapidly increasing hematoma, it could press on the nerve and cause an increasing neurological deficit. Um, the tight bandage is a very uh, common cause. The moment you see any nerve injury or you suspect any nerve injury, immediately cut all the constricting bandages and flex the knee. And that uh, is what is required. Now, this is uh, what I was saying that the, the epidural anesthesia itself is a big risk of peripheral nerve injury. And but must remember that the silver lining is that most of these are transient and they resolve. And uh, and that's that's a good thing. So just have to keep them under observation, put them in a splint, and see. Uh, the tunique uh, it can be one of the offenders and you may limit the use of tunique. We personally use it only for the time of cementing. The moment cement is mixed, the tunique is inflated, bone is washed. And uh, uh, Henrik Malko has shown that if the cement has been in contact with bone for 4 minutes, then the blood cannot get into the interface. So if you want it, you could just inflate it for 5 minutes, which is your choice. But definitely with the uh, uh, increasing experience, if you can reduce your uh, tunique time to less than 30 minutes, then using tunique or not using tunique is really doesn't make a difference. It's your choice. Uh, and this is again, like I said, divide the bandages, flex the knee and uh, and uh, then you know evaluate for hematoma see that the patient doesn't have a uh, condition like a patient if a patient had uh, hemophilia he could bleed every time and compress the uh, common peroneal nerve and develop a foot drop and you correct his uh, factor 8 levels his nerve comes back and this will go a few times if you are not able to maintain the factor 8 levels at the uh, correct place now periprosthetic fracture is uh, another devastating complication and this is uh, i want to show you very illustrative case this is a patient of mine 65 year old lady pain in both knees and uh, I, uh, these were the x-rays uh, i think look fairly routine to me and then uh, i uh, had a bilateral total knee replacement done on her then we did the x-rays she started complaining of pain on the second day and it was more on the left side and then we did the fresh x-ray and this is what we saw and how did it happen we, we saw the x-rays preoperatively they were all fine so we went back and uh, and something was missing so we went back to those x-rays and found that there was already a pre-existing fracture there in those pre-operative x-rays and all that I did was I missed that, failed to see it and when I operated, I displaced it. Fortunately, and look at it, when the patient was complaining of pain, there was much more swelling, much more tenderness on that side as compared to this side. But I failed to take cognizance, but fortunately it was not displaced and we decided to treat it conservatively in the plaster, did not uh, displace further. Just a few things about the predisposing factors, the osteoporosis, anterior femoral notching, rheumatoid arthritis, steroid therapy and neurological conditions predisposed to fracture and uh, the, it is very controversial. But most people believe that although notching causes weakness of the femur, there is little evidence that little bit of notching should really cause a fracture. There is no association between the fracture in spite of having demonstrated uh, a compromise of the strength in the femur, it does not cause fracture. Now, the Trials of treatment will depend on the condition of the knee and the process is stable or not, fracture pattern, quality of bone stock and the presence of any other implant like a total hip in the femur uh, and general physical conditions. Uh, and then uh, the uh, most important thing is that you have to give a painless stable knee. If it is an undisplaced, you could give a brace or a support. If the implant is stable, you could do an osteosynthesis. If the implant is loose, you have to do a revision with a major stem. You could use sometimes uh, in a patient who is not very fit, you could use a, to use a cross stain or something like that. But the real treatment is the either the log plate or the intramedullary uh, nails as uh, demonstrated in these cases, supraconylar nailing and sometimes you may have to do a tibia nailing. Now dislocation of the knee is a rare complication but again a very devastating complication. Uh, it is um, It can occur because you have not balanced the knee properly, you have been told about the flexion extension balance. If there is an imbalance in flexion gap, if there is inadequate uh, uh, selection of implants or malrotation of the components leading to incompetence of the uh, of the uh, extensor mechanism and then this is uh, uh, what has to be done urgently you must reduce because the artery is at risk and then once you do that then you operate to take care of the stability quick word about the periprosthetic joint infection i noticed that we are not attending it so maybe i was expected to do it, it is very from 0.2 to 2.5 percent if a patient has a prolonged wound bleeding drainage hematoma formation at surgical site or reoperation for the evacuation of hematoma the patient is at deep risk for infection and you know these are the various risk factors 
and it may be well to screen the patient for a pre-existing infection as was suggested in this very old paper and uh, uh, the routine use of antibiotics we all use it has been discussed that uh, but there may be little merit in continuing it beyond 24 hours and uh, the uh, the uh, in me i would ask you to uh, abstain from differentiating between the superficial and the deep i think that's something more for a hip for a knee, I think any infection should be considered as a deep infection and accordingly treatment should be taken. Um, these are the criteria because you must remember one thing, for the first six weeks after injury, the CRP may be as high as 90 to 100. So a raised ER CRP in the post-operative period in the first six weeks doesn't mean infection. So you have to see how much it is, is it more than 100 or it is showing a rising trend, that would be really have me worried. Um, this is um, the WOS um, uh, protocol basically saying that you have to look at ESR, CRP and if they are high, aspirate the joint culture and see what you have got there and these are the two protocols, one for high uh, risk of infection, one for lower, uh, lower risk of infection and for the perioperative period when we will have early one, it is the attempt should be to save the prosthesis, go in, take out the, uh, take out the insert, wash it thoroughly, debride it and put a new liner, that's what you should do. For the chronic stages, it is different. This year, we met in um, in uh, Philadelphia. The MSIS had organized an international consensus meeting, and we had more than 200 delegates from 80 countries, and uh, a consensus uh, statement was developed to treat the uh, infection for different stages and different types, which will hopefully be published in the CORR for the, uh, as part of the MSIS um, uh, proceedings. Injury to MCL is another very, very uh, 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 serious injury. Just remember two things. One is you should know when an MCL gets avulsed. An MCL gets avulsed when you are exposing, when you have a fat, short female and you are trying to go and release the deep part, you may end up over-releasing it. The MCL will also get injured when you are going the posterior cuts and you are not careful. Some of the jigs have got a, a column where you, the blade cannot sway. But you should be very, very careful. There should be a home run between the MCL and the bone. And the third time when you can injure the MCL is when your uh, very over-energetic uh, assistant is trying to anteriorly deliver the tibia in a stiff knee where there is, uh, you know, the, it's not very loose and then you are trying to put the insert and you suddenly find that you have gone. Now, personally, I don't think that I would be happy leaving a non knee. There is some controversy. Some people have said that, uh, and, and of course, uh, when you are removing the meniscus, if you are not careful about leaving a ring, you could damage the MCL. Now, you could. people have said that you can actually just repair the MCL mid-substance and, and the results are good because there is a lot of regeneration potential. But personally, I go with the report which says that one must go for a constrained knee to, in order not to have any problem and whenever we have actually tried to repair and put a constrained knee, the patients have done well. We usually put them a hinge plate, although a lot of people say that a hinge plate should not be used. We put them in a hinge plate and, uh, and we have uh, uh, done well. The extensor me uh, mechanism injuries, another injury, it has been discussed when we were discussing the denervation and the uh, vascularity. And the only important thing I would like to say is that sometimes uh, the multiple repairs at these uh, injuries which are sustained during surgery fail and this is a technique we have described in the journal of arthroplasty for uh, sort of anchoring the allograft we actually shape the uh, extensor mechanism allograft in a special way and then we divide the host bone particularly if uh, the patient has been operated by Rajiv and the <coughs> native petla is there it is very easy just split the petla vertically into two and then wedge that uh, tenon into the between the two parts and then have two screws going from medial to lateral and then do a circlage wire if you like and then the patients uh, do usually quite well and we have published this technique and we are quite happy with it. Um, and so take home message is that the rate of your TKR will continue to increase. Now we must, if we are going to do TKR, must be aware of the various complications so many of them can be fatal and uh, you should always be aware. Fortunately most of, the, most of these are minor but you will do well to actually be conversant. When you look at a patient, before you take him to OR, say does this patient have any risk factors for perioperative complications, go through in your mind with a list of possible complications and many times you will be able to do something to prevent it. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Any questions? Questions? Yeah. If uh, the post operative you keep the limb uh, to start with infection, as you said, if you see uh, too much bleeding, you keep the limb infection. Why not you keep uh, the limb you can do that, there is absolutely no problem. I have seen this uh, post-op care is like religion, everybody has his own. What we like to do is to make the patient start flexing right in the post-operative room and uh, we, we start uh, making, we make them sit on the edge of the bed and
by late afternoon or evening, they would like to make them stand and walk if they are not paralyzed by the anesthetic. But then if you have any issues, I would much rather give the rest to the joint, give ice packs, and the ice packs are a part of treatment anyway, excessive bleeding or no excessive bleeding. But then you would do well to flex if you think that there is a problem with uh, treating. I don't think that uh, dealing, although I am a proponent of uh, rapid immobilization, but uh, rapid mobilization, but I don't see any wrong if you are comfortable in mobilizing the patient after one or two days. It's really your choice. Sir, what is your regime for anti uh, to prevent embolism? Yeah, we actually uh, do, it's a uh, multi-purpose thing. One thing is that you must remember these patients are walking before they come to you. So the whatever starts, starts on the table. The insert of surgery or this thing. Because these are not the patients who are immobile before surgery, most of the time. So we usually keep a uh, text talking on the opposite side which is not being operated. Because you are, the. Uh, it's not that you cannot get a, a thrombosis on the opposite side which is not being operated. And second thing is we do use a, a, a pharmacological thromboprophylaxis but we like to keep it as short. Because the problem with the thromboprophylaxis is that if it is really effective it is going to cause bleeding. You know, if it doesn't cause bleeding, then it is not effective in preventing thrombosis. So, you are going to have those hematomas, you are going to have those problems. So, you will need to carefully observe the patient. So, one of the things, one of the main reasons for mobilizing the patient early is that I am more comfortable stopping the uh, stopping the uh, anticoagulant uh, early because the patient starts coughing. A lot of centers would still do an ultrasound on the patient, a doctor, before discharging them to make sure. But I think doctor is. Uh, very operator dependent and second thing is in a public hospital where I work, I, we have not been able to make it a protocol to have an in-house. Sometimes we discharge the patient in the evening because another patient has come in and it's not possible to have radiology on the side. Is, is there any rule of uh, uh, intermittent cough pump? Yes, definitely. Mechanical advice is you, you have to do something. You know, the FAKP can be compared or questioned. But uh, there is no harm. If a patient has a contraindication indication to low molecular weight happening because an elderly man with a compromised renal status, I will not give him. So we will have to rely on the mechanical prophylaxis as well as the uh, as well as the early Rajesh, you are seeing all the patients of all the spectrum from the poor patients, uh, middle class and high class patients. Uh, down the line uh, of your 30, 40 years experience, do you think that this number of prophylaxis or thromboembolism is <laughs> really threatening. Overall picture. Uh, uh, I would say, I would answer that by saying yes. In the Indian body. The problem is, I showed you a case where it happened to a hospital employee's mother. Yeah. You know, that's as bad as it can get. Yeah. It cannot get any worse than this. And is it, it an aberration? Or and it was an aberration, I agree. But what I am saying is that you cannot say blanket, give a blanket statement that it doesn't occur in India. People have a view that maybe it is less common. That doesn't matter. So I say, don't use low molecular weight happening if you don't want to. But say in a hip replacement, even in the Americans who are not uh, giving thromboprophylaxis are giving heparin when they are preparing the femur. So that is a thromboprophylaxis. That is a pharmacological prophylaxis to give heparin because in hip replacement when you are preparing the femur in the posterior approach, you twist the limb all the way, the femoral vein gets completely obliterated and you can form a trauma. So those people are giving heparin. So that is also, so it's a possibly a war between industry and the orthopedic surgeons which are trying to fight with each other. But it's not that they don't believe in that. They give, uh, they give uh, the oral anticoagulant, they give aspirin. So what I'm saying is you have to be aware because if you lose a patient, because all you get a DVT, the post-plebitic syndrome is a very, very distressing condition. Ask a patient who has had it, and it's a terrible thing, apart from the risk of unnameable This lady I showed you, we had to put in, uh, on the very second day, we had to put in an IBC uh, filter right away, and then put her on anticoagulant, oral anticoagulant, this uh, low molecular weight happening, and then switched over to oral, and uh, the last I saw her, the, he, it had decanalyzed. But then think of the invasive procedure which I, we have to do when you have such a big trauma sitting there. So it is not that it doesn't happen. It's not correct to say it doesn't happen. The problem is when it happens, you'll have little defense if you've not done anything. So what you can say is that we do believe in thromboprophylaxis. There's nothing wrong in it. You may not believe in no molecular weight happens. I don't care. But you should believe in thromboprophylaxis. So you should do everything which is required to prevent a clot, whether it is a mechanical symptom, text talking, early mobilization. You say, I do all this, I don't believe. Maybe I give a screen, whether it works or not. But then, that's what it is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I have the honor to introduce the next speaker, Mr. Lawrence Friedman, who has just arrived from um, London. He's going to talk on patella and total knee arthroplasty. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting me, Jay. So, the last talk is for lunch.
Our last thought before lunch is going to concern the patella and um, in the total knee replacement. We're going to look at the anatomy, resurfacing, problems with tracking, fracture and loosening. Why do we have a patella? So just to remind you, it's a sesamoid bone and it generates a lever. In other words, it increases the strength of your quadriceps for kicking and push-off. We've got three main issues. Preoperatively, shall we resurface it or not? Interoperatively, we need to assess tracking and then the supposed operative complications. Well, should we or resurface or not? We can look at revision rates, whether we do or don't resurface it. Perhaps more importantly, we should look at the clinical outcomes, both in terms of function and anterior knee pain, and what are the complications of resurfacing it. Why is it revised? Uh, it's either a late problem, it's anterior knee pain, or simply because you can in those patients who have complaints about their knee, which as we know, are about 30% of people will be unhappy in some one way or another one year after a knee replacement. Does it matter about um, so anterior knee pain? If we look at it, we can show that in fact there's no benefit with patellar resurfacing, and if you look at different prostheses, there's no difference. Look at the knee arthroplasty trial, which was a multi-centre randomised control trial with four arms, uh, looking at various types of knee replacement. Um, we found that um, this was a large centre, uh, 17, over 1,700 patients, it was multi-centre, and there was no difference. The knee scores were the same whether or not you revised the patella. There was no difference in um, EQ5D, which is a uh, measurement of uh, their general health, there was no difference between um, the metal components or the physical components. And if we look at patella-related reoperations, they're similar between the two groups. And if we look at an economical analysis, uh, it may be cheaper if you don't resurface it, but that's offset by the cost of a reoperation. And overall, there was no difference. And the message is that you can do what you wish. There will be groups who resurface it and groups who don't. And I think if you go around, uh, both within any one country and certainly between different countries, you can find large groups of surgeons, one of whom will um, say you have to replace it, one of whom says you don't replace it. My own experience is I don't replace it. I must have done probably getting on for 2,000 knees now. And a few have had anterior knee pain, but it's very small. What about patella tracking? Um, we know that it's um, a problem if you have an increased Q angle, if there's lateral retinacular tightness, or so-called overstuffing. The Q angle, just to remind you, is the angle between the femur and the tibia, and it's increased by, um, as you know, their various alignment, internal rotation of the components, or lateral placement if you do replace the patella. And I just focus on, um, you've probably heard surgical technique before, it's um, a bad technical error to leave the components in internal rotation. If you're worried, externally rotate them a little bit more. It's uh, patella subluxation is a relatively common failure of a uh, total knee replacement of mode, and um, it's often associated with tibial internal rotation. It's not always standard to take a skyline view, so I think it's actually probably underestimated. At least in the United Kingdom, most patients only get an AP and a lateral view unless they have pain, and I suspect if we look for it, we'd find it more commonly. If we look at the patella tilt and subluxation in total knee arthroplasty and uh, relate it to pain, fixation design, what we find is that if you do a lateral release, there doesn't, um, there's no difference. So if it's going to occur, the releasing it will not save you. And what we find is that um, if you do a lateral release, it doesn't increase the complication rate, and that's if out of a thousand knees where 314 were carried out. So you can do it, but it doesn't seem to, it's not comp it doesn't carry complications, and it doesn't actually improve the problem of patella subluxation. What are the problems you might see with the patella? Well, they fall into three. One is a fracture, the other is maltracking, and the last is anterior knee pain. If we look at patella fractures, um, then we can find the overall rate is around uh, 1%, and there's a correlation with resurfacing. 88 have no traumatic event, in other words, it seems to just develop after the surgery, and over 50% are uh, associated with loosening. Um, of the periprosthetic um, patella fractures, 
If we look at how to manage them, seven that managed conservatively, three were fixed, um, some went on to a patelectomy. And I think what you'd notice is that actually if you get a patella fracture, the results, most are only good to fair. So it's a bad, uh, bad complication to get. We've seized up for the moment. Probably talking too fast, he couldn't keep up with me or something. Ah, sorry. My fault, probably. Thanks. So just going back, so you don't want to have a patella fracture because it does seriously um, affect the outcome. If we look at um, the cases of a spontaneous patella fracture following primary knee replacements, it's associated with previous knee operations, with a mechanical malalignment. The third one is down to the surgeon, if you leave only a very thin patella afterwards, and if you have a patella baja. Um, but we do know that if you have an unresurfaced uh, patella that fractures, um, it's rare, but they do very well. They heal and they don't have a bad outcome. So certainly, uh, whereas anterior knee pain might be more common if you don't resurface it, patella fracture is more common if you do resurface it. Um, so that's why there's not much difference. There's problems in each of both groups. What about looking at uh, patella failure after a token knee replacement? Um, we can see that about a 5% um, failure rate. And the risk factors for patella loosening are if you carry out a lateral release, um, if you gain, if the surgeon puts it too medial with a thicker tibial component and the uh, preoperative uh, degree of valgus and flexion. And also, again, this partly comes down to your patient selection, but if you operate on the very fat people, they're more likely to get a fracture, um, males and those who have a various degrees of uh, more than five degrees, and large patella components. So if we um, patella is surfacing to second stage, it is done for persistent anterior knee pain, and as you look, if we look at 22 patients, uh, some are no better, and some are better. My own experience is that a lot of them aren't better. And that once you've got anterior knee pain after a knee replacement, whatever you do, they seem to keep it. And it comes back, and I think, to, although not part of this um, lecture, that there is a definite, uh, relatively significant rate of people who are unhappy with their total knee replacements, regardless of good patient selection and good surgeon technique. And anterior knee pain is part of that. As you'd expect, again, if you look at the knee trial, their, um, their knee scores deteriorate before they have their resurfacing and it improves afterwards. It's also interesting to note that if you look at the density of the patella where it hasn't been resurfaced, that actually they get increased patella density and better function over time. And I think that, again, fits with my own experience. If you revise just the patella alone and the knee replacement, you often find that it's quite densely scarred and it looks a good structure and you do have to wonder as you're doing the operation what was causing their knee pain. If you revise it, you can, so if you have a resurfaced patella, one of the problems is so-called patella clunk syndrome. It's a definite problem, they complain about it. It's more likely to occur with posterior stabilised knees and it's due to what's called impingement in the box with a fibrous nodule. You can do an arthroscopic resection of the fibrous tissue, many are better but not all. <coughs> Component design, um, we've got a variety, polyethylene uh, or metal backed, dome versus anatomic, fixed versus mobile. And um, all we can say is that the dome doesn't matter, metal backed is not good and mobile bearings are of no clinical benefit. In other words, use um, a polyethylene one, put it in the middle and you've done the best that you can. <coughs> so in summary, resurfacing doesn't reduce anterior knee pain. And I think that's perhaps the, the, the main message to give you when people say, should I resurface it, will it eliminate anterior knee pain? The answer is no. Um, that if you do resurface it, you're more likely to get a fracture. The fractures are difficult to treat. That revision is more common if it's not resurfaced. And if you are going to um, use a, a patella button, use an all polyethylene one. Thank you very much. You're, well, we're, we're on the other side of the divide a little bit. But, uh, the point is that I think one is situational, mm -hmm. the other is the expectations you can take. The, the studies which have been put up mm -hmm. 
are, for whatever reason, being put up mostly by people who don't see <coughs> patients in advanced stages of region, in a region. They don't see 20, 30 degrees of virus or virus. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, the patients that we see are bilaterally involved. That's one. Second thing is, more often than not, these people, even if you tell them not to, they will certainly try to bend it far back. It's, it's so, I mean, where you're using the patella, that is, or we need to, most of them will try to either sit cross leg on the bed, even if you tell them not to go on the ground, they will do it on the bed or sit cross leg comfortably and then pull the leg up to them. Third thing is that we have done, I, I can't give the exact figures, but I would say at least uh, 2,000 in the last three or four years with resurfacing. We have had one post traumatic fracture which was wired luckily and it just removed the wire which which was not anything to do with we routinely do the uh, circum pottery and so what I really feel is that you know, we really need to look at this side there are two different issues but the good thing maybe both agree is we use all polymer well um, I hear exactly what you say and I think what I just would say here, I'm talking about an English experience, so it's what knees were operating on in England. We don't see these very severe degrees of bearers. The patients, by and large, do not want to sit cross-legged. So it may be that what you're saying is we're getting away with it because we have a slightly less deformed knee, possibly. Um, and I hear exactly what you're saying about, you know, resurfacing it and your good results and your lack of complications. It's, it's, it's one is about results. So I have three people mm. sitting here who yeah. vouch for what I'm saying. It's very interesting. I was not resurfacing for mm. many years. And about 15 to 20 percent of my mm. follow-up mm. OPD yeah. time, clinic time, was wasted in listening to this sitting up, standing yeah. and climbing stairs. Mm. And it has become so much improved that it's worth a visit. I think I invite you to see this, actually I mean it, because I, they, but on the other hand, either there were so many which I had done before, who kept grumbling, but where are they now? So is it that they'll grumble for two years and then get well, or is it that these ones will not grumble at all? And there's been sufficient time to see fractures, so these are observations, I cannot yeah. challenge either side, because yeah. I've done both sides. And I can't believe such large numbers would have left me alone. Yeah. I, I think if I remember not more than four or five instances where unresurfaced ones had to be resurfaced, even though literature suggests that if you do that, they are not as happy as they would have been if you had resurfaced on day one. If you were to resurface, then do it on day one. But these four, which we I remember four bilaterals, which were our own, and mm -hmm. these four after the resurfacing have been happy. So yeah. it's very difficult. I mean, I, I, when yeah. I'm, 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 though sometimes when I listen to somebody like this, I want to go back and then again stop doing it. <laughs> I don't know the real answer. Well, I think we, you know, we bring our own experience to the table, which is perhaps more important than papers. And you know, so my experience is I don't resurface. I get good results. Your experience is you are resurfacing with good results, and I think that's really what I notice as you either say within a country or within different countries that there's. Some who do, who some that don't. And I've just tried to highlight some of the issues for you. I think at the end of the day, you can make your own decision up. And um, there I said, it's a bit like the approach to hit. Do you want to go from the back or from the front? You will find people who will argue for a long time. Um, it's one of those, I think, unsolved issues at the moment. But thank you very much for your comments. I, mean, I, I agree, I, I resurface. But I, mm. I say to people, I think it's fine not to resurface and we'll get good mm. results. <coughs> will get some patients going to me a few. The other thing you do sometimes get is loss of flesh. And then sometimes I stick you over stuff, I put too big a panel component, you'll get loss of flesh at one bit. If you are going to resurface, you've got to do it properly. Mm -hmm. And the failures always occur because it's been cut too thin, or it's been vascularized, or it's not tracking properly. And if you do it correctly, and I think I know how to do that now, you'll get good results. If you do it badly, so is, is your view, Mr. Hunt, it takes 30 years to learn to do it properly? Sure. That's, that's well, <laughs> which case, case let's not do it. This year, so yeah. Okay. Anyway, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you so much. We announced the lunch, and uh, 2 o'clock, we start sharp. And uh, we've got 50 minutes. So let's have a big bite lunch. 2 o'clock. I wish I could eat some. But my hope is that you can change it.
What we do is we resurface Petala. We resurface Petala, but look for some excuse to leave it. We have a problem. 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 We have so felt their general health was better. And importantly, perhaps for the orthopaedic community, total hip replacements are 88% better, whereas varicose veins and hernias are only 50%. So when people come to decide where they want to spend their money at government level, orthopaedics have got some good data to show it should be with us. Um, we can look at their general health. These are rather complex score, but each arrow is from a different centre. And we can see that their Oxford score goes up and their general health goes up after knee replacement. A national joint registry was introduced in 2003, somewhat later than the Swedish one. It was compulsory, and endpoint um, revision is the endpoint. And it will pick up outliers, those who fall outside the normal pattern, be it the surgeon, the prosthesis, or the hospital. And initially when it was introduced, there was quite a lot of resistance in the United Kingdom, because unlike the Swedish hip registry, this was um, a government-based registry. It wasn't owned by the doctors and for the doctors. However, um, we still complied with it, and now it's the largest in the world. It's collated over a million procedures, and um, it started off with the hip, then the knee, ankle, and shoulder and elbow to follow. And it produces some really good figures by virtue of the fact it's so large. And what I'd ask you to look at here, if we look at the National Joint Registry, we can see that the revisions are greatest in the uncemented hips and in the unicondylate knee. All the others are grouped quite closely along the bottom. And this is our revision rates for bicondylar knees, but if we look at the implant constraint size, and we can see that the uh, posterior cruciate retaining are about 3%, and uh, if we have constrained, it's 4%. So it's not a huge difference in the type of prosthesis. And if we look at posterior cruciate retaining versus um, with fixed bearings and mobile bearings, again, a, there is a small difference. We can look at the revision rates by age groups uh, and the different types of prosthesis. And what I draw your um, eye to here is that the revision rate for unicondylar knee replacements is approaching 7%, whereas for total knee replacements, it's down at 2 to 3%. We can also look at the radial out logical outcomes, which you're all familiar with. And um, we can look at the alignment and we can also look at the um, alignment with navigated knees. And the message really is that navigation doesn't actually make the overall alignment much better. And it takes longer. So um, I can only speak for our country. It's sort of had a great wave of enthusiasm. And now it's dropped off and not many people are navigating their knees. We can look for lines of lucency and to describe various zones. But those lucent lines don't always correspond with the knee coming loose. Some stay um, static and some will progress. But the point where you have the lucent is, is more significant. Is it loose or not is a difficult question often to answer. And often from radiology alone, you don't get the answer. Or plain x-rays, you might need to do a bone scan. What's the impact of collecting all this data? Well, it clarifies contentious issues. What sort of replacement should we use? Should we use unicompartmental, bicompartmental, cemented, uncemented? For those who are going to pay for their care at a government level, they can look at what's doing well, what isn't. But it does perhaps lead to a restriction of autonomy for the surgeon, so that your own preference might be overridden by those who are commissioning the, the, um, the actual procedure. And if we look at hip replacements, for instance, um, this is uh, one group in the United Kingdom. The government decided they would... Um, only fund cemented hip replacements um, because they cost less and they seem to be doing better. Uh, and if we look, however, though, at the types of primary hip replacements which we're carrying out, we can see in the top line that actually cemented has gradually been reducing and cement less is increasing. And it's a good question that we should ask ourselves, why are we putting in an increasing number of prostheses that our hip registry shows are failing? And why are we putting less hips in um, which seem to be doing better. 
And as always, the devil's in the detail. These don't show you that perhaps we're choosing a cementless hip because of the size of the prosthesis needed, or whether we needed a sided uh, right and left sided, and so on. Um, but the danger of collecting all the figures is that those who might be funding the care start to restrict the surgeon's autonomy, and the surgeon's autonomy is well placed. The individual surgeon to know which is the best joint for you. So um, again, these are the um, revision rates, and we can see that uncemented have the greatest revision rates, even though we're doing more of them. So in summary, we can measure what we're doing now, much more than 10 years ago. We've got um, the, the National um, Hip Registry has really um, produces a large amount of information that we can't ignore. We may not agree with it, but it is there um, for us to ponder over actual outcomes. And what's, I think, important about the um, National Hip Registry is that your own, you only know how good you are or bad you are by those who actually come back to you. So if you're in one hospital and when patients get a problem, they go to another hospital for whatever reason, you won't know whether you're producing problems. You only know which patients come back to you. And very few surgeons, in my experience, follow up their own patients long term. The effect of the National Hip Registry is that patients are followed up long term you know what prosthesis was put in, and you also know um, which surgeon put it in and which hospital it was put it in. And then you start to see outliers. So you can see a given surgeon's results are way, way outside of all the other surgeons. And therefore, we can focus on, is that surgeon operating on a different group of patients, or does he actually have a problem? The National Hip Registry has picked up the problems often before we've been aware of them, such as metal-on-metal -metal hip replacement. And it, obviously, national databases are very large. But the last thing, does it alter our practice? And the answer at the moment is, no, it isn't. That we're carrying on doing what we think is best. And we're managing to um, e ignore what our sort of national database of over a million cases is showing to us. And what messages can I bring you? Because um, the National Hip Registry is rare to be new. It's only 10 years old. I don't think you've got one yet in, in India. And... The first thing is, this year, for the first time, individual surgeons had their infection rates published. So any patient of the public, any of you, could look up my results and you'd know what my infection rate is. Well, that's uh, quite a sharp tool, because if the patients know you individually how good or bad, they will start to choose what they want to come and see. And at our um, equivalent of your Indian Orthopaedic Association last month, when we were discussing these outcome measures, we had a member of the public who was on the... Um, he was chairing the session, and um, I think the thought was, well, you know, she said, we actually look at the National Hip Registry, <coughs> and the thought amongst the, the, the doctors, to a large extent, was, yes, but can you understand the Hip Registry? You know, you're not skilled. And her reply, I think, 